I'm Richard Bangs, exploring the ecological nexus between North and South America, this small but potent package of a country, Costa Rica. The people here are on a tear to preserve the extravagant biodiversity of their national field of dreams, and it seems to be working. What is the secret of their success? I'm off to find out as a traversal land often cited as a green beacon to the planet in a place that two recent international studies proclaimed the happiest country on Earth. Costa Rica is a place of rivers wild to get to the sea, mountains that speak with fire, and rainforests that obey no rules. It has more species of animals and plants than the United States and Canada combined. An ethnically diverse democracy, Costa Rica has literacy rates and health care comparable to the most developed countries in the world. It's abolished its military and enjoyed greater peace and political stability than all of its neighbors. But what has brought me back to Costa Rica so many times over the years is a sense of well-being I felt in few countries on Earth. So where does this go? Oh, it's over that way. Oh, gracias. Pura vida. <laughs> Pura vida. It's a phrase I've been hearing ever since I came to Costa Rica years ago. At some point I realized that I've heard it everywhere throughout the country, uttered by everybody from guides to park rangers to bus drivers, even bureaucrats. But until recently, I never really considered what Pura Vida meant. I know that literally it means pure life, but does it go deeper? Could it in some way be a clue to the roots of Costa Rica's exceptionalism? Here, endless natural wonders rouse the faculties and excite the soul. But what I find most remarkable is the sensitivity that people have to their surroundings. Costa Ricans have set aside one quarter of their land as national parks and protected areas. How did they manage this when so many people in other countries have stood by while their natural wonders were degraded or destroyed? How did Costa Ricans fend off the miners, loggers, farmers, burners, developers, and others who felled and flattened rainforests around the world? How did they trick time? My friend Michael Kay has lived in Costa Rica for more than 30 years and was first to raft the whitewater rivers here. He and his wife Yolanda also founded Costa Rica Expeditions and some of the country's first eco-lodges. So, Michael, why does Costa Rica seem to have this almost exceptional ethos in conservation? And is there any relationship with Pura Vida? Richard, I've been trying to figure this out for 30 years, and I really haven't been able to. But maybe I can find some people that can shed some light on that. I'd like that. Okay, great. Alvaro Ugalde, once named Time Magazine's environmental leader of the century, has dedicated nearly 40 years of his life to conservation issues. As a biology student in the 60s, Alvaro became alarmed at the rapid destruction of Costa Rica's forests. In a matter of three decades, we went from like 50% of forest to 20% of forest. I found that Costa Ricans were already uneasy about more fires in the dry season, less water, um, and they talk about the animals that used to be around, there are no more animals, etc. The Congress had already approved some legislation that would open the door for people to do conservation. For much of his career, Alvaro worked from within the government to expand the park system. My inspiration is to keep Costa Rica the way it is. That's good. But what do you think about foreign visitors when they come here? What should they do? What should they bring home? They should take home a better understanding of their own personal responsibilities in their home. Either we all do what we have to do as individuals, or it's going to be very difficult to, to move forward from here on. I, I've been to Costa Rica, I've been fortunate enough to come to Costa Rica a few times and, and visit some of the parks. And every time I come here, I seem to meet people in and out the park that say, Pura Vida. What does that mean? I think the, the fact that we perceive ourselves as a happy nation has a lot to do with it. 
and uh, Pura Vida it just be became a, a, a symbol for Costa Ricans, uh, for happy Costa Ricans, and for friendly Costa Ricans. Thirty years ago, Costa Rica was little known to the outside world and was rarely found on a traveler's itinerary. Surfers in the 60s were among the first to discover the fury and thrill of these shores. They mostly kept the secret to themselves until articles in National Geographic and the Smithsonian gave the rest of the world a preview of an endless summer escape far, far south of the border. Soon, the country was riding a wave of enthusiastic reviews from those who discovered a vacation getaway with safe traveling conditions, friendly locals, and seemingly limitless opportunities for pure adventure. Was it the glint of Pura Vida? Today, Michael and I will make a short stop at the Nictandra Institute before heading for the rarefied air of Monte Verde Cloud Forest. Surrounded by luxuriant gardens, the Nectandra Institute carries on the work of promoting conservation throughout Costa Rica. Rare plants are common here, and common plants are rare. But what becomes most evident is that the water cycle and life cycle are one. And one of the missions of the Nectandra Institute is to help communities with the tools and information to better manage the relationship between healthy forest and clean water. Evelyn Lynette was so impressed by the work done by the founders of Costa Rica's park system that she wanted to make her own contribution. They, they set aside 25%. So I got to thinking, but that's only 25%. What happened to the remaining 75%? We need 100%. <laughs> yeah, we, we can certainly nibble on that 75% and see what we can do with it. She and her husband bought a large tract of land to create a tundra a private reserve and research garden. With several partners, they formed a grassroots style outreach that includes everything from educational workshops to an innovative eco-loan program in which locals receive money to buy watershed land. The borrowers then repay interest by doing labor to restore and protect that land. The water is the central link among the forest, ecology, life as we need, and the future. So without it, we have no life. And that's the only message we, we need to get across to the young ones. While other parts of the world can rely on glaciers to act as water reservoirs, here there is no natural reservoir. The forests are essential for preventing runoff. There's no way to hold that water, even with torrential rain, it goes out. So without the forest, we have no water. And that's, that's just a very powerful link for, for the association members, the parents of these children. They, they know that unless they put the forest back, the kids will not have the water in their lifetime. You always are taught that you need to pay back. If you benefit, you should also put back in. When I came here, I saw this is also another type of beauty. This is a natural beauty, and that um, we need to take care of it. So that's my my little tiny contribution to to put back in a little bit of my time on this planet. Roiling in fountains of mist, the Monte Verde cloud forest has a magical realism about it. It seems a place to grasp the mystery that breathes behind things. Even humidity here is at its purest, 100%. Several different kinds of forest thrive in Costa Rica, and Monte Verde, literally Green Mountain, is a house of spirits to the cloud variety. Warm, moist air sweeps in off the ocean 
and is pushed upward by mountain slopes, where it seems to fill the infinite. The reserve unwinds with a well-maintained network of trails, and exploring them is like hiking through a grand green cathedral. Life is exuberant and pure here. I can almost inhale the incense of Pura Vida, surrounded by these massive ropes of vines and fairy chains of moss. So here we're at the top of Monte Verde and we're on the Continental Divide. So if I pour water in this direction, it goes all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. If I pour it in this direction, it goes all the way to the Pacific. As we descend the mountain slopes, the flickering wings of countless hummingbirds hypnotize with their iridescence. Hummingbirds are found only in the New World, but they spark fascination among bird lovers around the globe. Like all animals, they are vulnerable to habitat destruction and climate change. More than 25 species of hummingbird are currently threatened with extinction. To end the day, we happily succumb to the comforts of the Monte Verde Mountain Lodge. Wrapped along the edge of the cloud forest, the lodge is 4,600 feet above sea level. Staying here has a sort of paradoxical effect, making us feel like we're ensconced in the middle of the forest while feeling protected from the misty breezes that buffet nearby mountain peaks. One place where nature wins out is Tortuguero National Park, stretching along the Caribbean coast for 13 miles. lines of Tortuga Lodge meld breezily into a backdrop of tropical trees and orchids. Soft scented air drifts through eco-friendly rooms that make visitors feel in sync with the rhythms of the park beyond. This was the first nature lodge in the area. A vision of Michael's actualized. What are the characteristics? What are the things you have to do to get it right? You have to put the lodge near a park that will be kept in its natural state in perpetuity. The other thing you have to do to do it right is even if the park's protected, you have to pick a park that you really love being in, that you can really, because you're gonna be there that you can really give people a wonderful experience in so they'll tell their friends to come back. And where you have very, very good people, local people to teach you about the resource and to work with, so they'll make your guests happy and you'll be very happy working with them. One of those happy guests is Costa Rica's Vice President Luis Lieberman, who comes back year after year to fish with his friend and guide, Eddie Brown. We're in, in a region, a larger region, that is not particularly known for its political stability. But Costa Rica is the exception. It's the longest running democracy in Latin America. How did that happen? People here are very independent. Uh, we haven't had the hacienda type of culture. We never did. Uh, in our culture, political culture developed basically in the 1800s, in the late 1800s, in the 20th century, becoming every time more democratic. It was a lot of, um, of educated people, people educated in Europe and educated locally, that really believed that uh, power should be elected, not, not grabbed. And, and I think we take it very seriously. The country's proactive approach to preserving their green spaces tested that democratic process. We cannot inherit our kids a desert. And some people didn't like the idea that we were creating 
national parks or protected areas, but it, is, it has become kind of a national religion. And, and the, younger, the younger the kids, the more committed to that they are. Uh, you know, you, you just can't go and... That's exciting. Yeah, it, I, I find it very exciting. Uh, and hopefully someday we can increase even the area of protected areas. Ah, good one. So, my name is Richard. What is it? One of Michael's passions is puzzling out new ways to help guests at Tortuga Lodge get more engaged with local culture. A vast number of our guests, the great majority of our guests, really want to be able to feel like they're helping the local community. And what they can do best that the local community really learns is help kids learn English. Because English is the one thing that I can think of that I know that 10, 15 years from now is going to be really valuable for these kids, no matter what they end up doing. He conceived of a program in which English-speaking guests can volunteer to help kids from the local village learn English. This gives the children the chance to practice their language skills. And guests get to meet local families and learn more about Costa Rican culture. Evening spawns subtle changes along the canals of Tortuguero, and the jungle wraps itself in secrets. Halova Station, near the south end of the park, a surprise awaits. A gourmet dinner featuring a bounty of local ingredients. Valentin, ¿qué vas a servir para plato fuerte? Bueno, el lomito, vegetales, pescado, pollo, carne, carne. Okay, and so we've got kebabs, pinchos, kebabs, we've got four kinds, fish. Costa Rican cuisine, which relies heavily on fresh produce, is known for its panoply of subtle flavors. As first tinges of daylight mark the sky, we creep along the beach for a glimpse into one of nature's marvels, turtle hatching. Tortuguero is best known as a breeding ground for endangered turtles, the largest population in the world. And no place is more critical to the survival of the Caribbean's green sea turtle. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, these turtles were hunted to near extinction. Working closely with the Costa Rican government, the Caribbean Conservation Corporation helped establish Tortuguero National Park in 1970, a move that offered protection to the turtles and strictly controlled access to remaining populations. It isn't Pura Vida alone that drove Costa Rica's enlightened environmental policies. It seems to be some sort of magical convergence, a coming together of geographical providence, a truly far-sighted people, and perfect timing. It was a land too rugged to allow easy exploitation. It was a moment in time when a global appreciation of the environment was beginning to ignite. And there were leaders and visionaries who unroofed the odds and set about establishing a national park system as well as ecotourism infrastructures that delighted all who came to see. But perhaps what makes Costa Rican culture so evolved 
is that many different people from very diverse backgrounds have created something greater than the sum of their individual efforts. Biologists have a concept called hybrid vigor. By that, they mean that cross-breeding different strains of animals or plants results in something stronger than the individual strains. The same holds true for societies, and Costa Rica is a poster child. Pura Vida is not the cause of Costa Rica's uniqueness. It is the expression of it. Conservation is never a done deal. Even here in Costa Rica, it's a contest without end. But no place glows warmer with the spirit of joy, hope, and inexhaustible promise, and the attendant feelings of a bright, unspotted life. Not only does Costa Rica have its homegrown heroes, it is a hero to the rest of the planet. A magnet and a model for ecologists, adventurers, researchers, and all who want to experience the magic of Pura Vida and be part of this luminous stitch in time.